Thank you very much, uh, John and uh, Di, and uh, very nice to uh, be joining you uh, here uh, this evening. I, I guess I have to apologise in a sense. Um, the apology is going to be along the lines that uh, we, we have three chapters to consider in uh, Habakkuk, uh, and there's two classes. Uh, so, by definition, that means that we're perhaps not going to have to or able to go into a deep dive on uh, many areas. And really what I want to try and do in the two sessions that we've got is to really give you an overarching view on the book of Habakkuk. We, we might say it's Habakkuk 101. So, uh, apologies for the likes of those who uh, are of the age of Brother John. Uh, some of this will be fairly basic. But in saying that, I think for some of us, Habakkuk is a book that is obscure. And indeed, if you don't uh, do uh, your daily readings, I think it's on December the 12th and 13th, then there goes the opportunity to consider Habakkuk uh, for another year. Uh, it's fair to say that it's uh, a book that, uh, whilst we're familiar with uh, Habakkuk 2 and at verse 4, that finds its way on three occasions uh, into the New Testament. Uh, and as we'll see, Habakkuk 1 and verse 5, that also finds its way into uh, Acts 13. But outside of that, there is very little else that uh, deals with Habakkuk in the New Testament. So, in a sense... Uh, Habakkuk is very much an obscure book of the Bible. And I guess that then begs the question, why would we bother studying an obscure book? W wouldn't it be better to study perhaps one of Paul's writings or the words of Jesus or something along those lines? And uh, perhaps there could be a strong argument uh, that would suggest, well, I'm going to get so much more if it was New Testament. Why would we go back to an obscure Old Testament prophet. Well, I want to suggest to you that there's three good reasons why the prophecy of Habakkuk is relevant for today. And the first of those is that what Habakkuk is going to be speaking about, it's all contemporary issues. Uh, one has only got to look down at Habakkuk chapter 1 and at verse 5. Look among the nations, see, wonder and be astounded. Now, obviously, in its first utterance, this was, of course, referring to the Babylonians. But for us, what's taken place in the last 10 days? If somebody had have said to you that Russia was going to come down into Ukraine, a democratic country, you'd be saying, tell them they're dreaming. But, of course, Bible students like ourselves know that Ezekiel 38 dictates that Russia is going to make uh, that advance down, of course, supplemented by Daniel. So there's just perhaps one example that we can say that right from our reading today, look, be amazed. Can we look and be amazed? Certainly we can. The second point that I think uh, brings some relevancy to the prophecy of Habakkuk is this phrase, the just shall live by faith. Now, in a sense, we're going to explore this in greater detail in our second class. But just think for a moment, and, and I'm sure you're familiar with the occurrences of that particular phrase in the New Testament. It's quoted by Paul in Romans chapter 1 and at verse 16. In Galatians, when he wants to sort of start to expand on a concept of faith and our association with the promises to Abraham and our baptism uh, into Christ and what that brings to us, he draws upon that particular verse. And as a segue into that magnificent uh, treatise on faith, Hebrews 11, the writer to the Hebrews likewise where does he draw inspiration? He begins by drawing upon the words of Habakkuk chapter 2 and at verse 4. And from that, he then uses that as the launch pad to then articulate what it means to live by faith. So arguably, one would say that the very kernel for Paul and the writer to the Hebrews, if you want to have a, a discussion, a treatise on faith, then... For those writers, it's a case that Habakkuk uh, 
is the seedbed for that discussion. The final point that I think brings some relevance to the prophecy of Habakkuk is the fact that it deals with this vexatious issue that we often find ourselves confronted with. Is God in control? Now, we know from scriptures and we have faith that God is in control of world events as we look around about us, as events take place in our own lives. We have confidence that God is in control. But to a broader audience, that very much is a question on people's lips. And certainly in discussions that I've had with individuals, perhaps to vindicate as to why they don't believe in a God, quite often they say, well, if there is a God, why would he allow such calamities to take place? Why would he allow disasters? Why would he allow situations like we're seeing in the Ukraine? Why, if there is a God, why would he allow these sorts of situations to develop? And you know what? Habakkuk provides us the answers as to why God does allow these circumstances to take place. And Habakkuk provides us with a reinforcement to our faith that in actual fact, God is in control. You'll be familiar with the words of Paul in Romans 15 and at verse 4, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that, but I think this also provides us with a further reinforcement as to the importance uh, of the Old Testament. And, and I know I'm probably speaking to, if I can say, the converted people who are convinced of the importance of the Old Testament, but increasingly, perhaps with a younger generation, there is perhaps uh, thoughts that say, well, it's perhaps better to sort of focus o- on the words of Jesus or the, the New Testament. I think, in a sense, Brother Roberts, in putting together our reading compendium, um, he acknowledges the importance of the New Testament because we do it twice in the year, but we also uh, bookend that with the Old Testament. But I think Paul, in a sense, captures the very essence, not just for Habakkuk, but for what was written in the Old Testament. And too often, as I say, people can be dismissive and say, oh, look, that just has got no application whatsoever. Well, Paul comes at it from a different angle and Paul actually says, and let's not forget that for many of the early first century Christians, it was a case that they had the Old Testament scriptures. That was what they had. Remember the New Testament, as we would call it, that was actually being assembled or compiled. They didn't necessarily have access to all of those particular writings, but they did have access to the Old Testament writings. And I really think that there's a power behind what Paul says here in Romans 15. It's all about us. You know, it's not just something that occurred so many years ago and that's history and let's forget about that. Paul actually says, you know what, what was written in former days, i.e. the Old Testament, it was written for our instruction. So there's sort of something that Paul says immediately, it provides instruction for us. But he goes further than that and he actually says, well, it's not just about instruction or knowledge or perhaps wisdom, but he goes on and he rounds out this uh, little verse by saying, it's all about encouragement and it's all about hope. And I see that as being powerful for us because as we go through Habakkuk, One of the things that I want to really uh, have us take away is that there is enormous encouragement in in the book of Habakkuk. There is enormous hope that is presented to us. And uh, in a couple of slides, uh, I'll reacquaint you with perhaps uh, some familiar verses of Habakkuk that just sort of, I guess, provide a beacon of hope uh, at a time when there was not a lot of hope in the nation. So again, Romans 15 underscores for us Uh, the importance of uh, why we would study an Old Testament book. What about Habakkuk himself? What what do we know about Habakkuk? Well, we know very little about Habakkuk. Uh, In fact, he is just introduced, if you've got your Bible uh, on your lap, um, we're just told that he's Habakkuk the prophet. Simple as that. Nothing else in Scripture enlightens us as to who Habakkuk is. And in a sense, that's 
stands in contrast to many of the other prophets. So if you think about Isaiah or Jeremiah or Daniel um, and even Malachi, what we know about those individuals, they open up by telling us, just uh, giving us a bit of a snapshot, who they were, where they came from. In the case of Habakkuk, he enters in and then enters out and basically he's just, he's the prophet. In very, very simple terms, that's all he is referred to. Now, of course, as I've noted there on the screen, um, Haggai and Zechariah also are just noted as the prophets. But if you go back through the Old Testament, quite often um, we get introduced and we get some sort of background details. And if you're like me, I, I like to know things, and I'm, I'm sure many of you do as well. You, you want to know what, what's the genealogy? What, what's the generations? How, how do they come about? And, uh, of course, we see the importance of that because you know, both Matthew and Luke trace back the genealogy of Jesus. And, and, of course, in the Kings and the Chronicles, there are copious records that tell us about individuals. But Habakkuk is a bit of a will-of-the-wisp. He comes in and he exits and that's all we know. Now, I have put down there that there is a possibility that he was a Levite. Um, that possibility is predicated on a couple of pieces of information. So it's what we might say is circumstantial uh, evidence as to why it could possibly be that Habakkuk was a Levite. Um, the ending of Habakkuk, and Habakkuk 3, by the way, which we'll look at next week, is actually a psalm. And we'll spend a bit of time. So uh, when we speak about the fact that there's 150 psalms, no, there's actually 151 psalms, 150 in the book of psalms, but there is one psalm, Habakkuk 3, that's outside of that. And if you look at the final words, these uh, bring to an end this particular prophecy. Um, it speaks about to the choir master with stringed instruments. And again, that's phraseology that you'll recognise immediately that does find its way uh, from the Psalms. Uh, the singers uh, were drawn from Levi. They certainly weren't Wilsons, I can tell you that. Um, but certainly 2nd of uh, Chronicles 34 actually uh, explains that uh, many who were involved in singing uh, came from Levi. Where's the importance of that? Well, the previous connection with Habakkuk chapter 3, psalm, singing, there are some uh, correlations that uh, emerge there. Perhaps, I think, uh, bringing it all together is if we have a look at Habakkuk chapter 1 and at verse 4. And uh, as Di beautifully read for us tonight, uh, you would have picked out immediately that one of the concerns that Habakkuk had was that people were very, very dismissive of the law. Now, I'm reading from the ESV. It'll be similar to what you've got. It says, so the law is paralysed and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous, so justice goes forth perverted. So you can see immediately the real concern that Habakkuk has is people have uh, done away with the law. People are not upholding justice. And if you think back, we're reading uh, Leviticus uh, at the present time, the whole idea of the laws and the keepers of the law were, of course, the Levites. As I say, I'm not being dogmatic. All I'm trying to do is to just try and present some evidence that might suggest to us who Habakkuk was. Now, when did Habakkuk write? Uh, you'll see good old Habakkuk's name, and I didn't bring a little pointer, and being vertically challenged, I'm sure if you were to look directly above Josiah and Jehoiakim there, you'll see Habakkuk. So Habakkuk was a prophet to Judah, and indeed some of you may have this uh, insert in your Bible. So you can sort of see the time frame in which Habakkuk wrote. Um, you'll see contemporaries of Habakkuk, so Joel and Jeremiah were contemporaries. Perhaps Daniel, although Daniel's a smidge after, and obviously Ezekiel, but certainly Joel, Jeremiah were contemporaries of this particular prophet. I guess it does as well just to think, what was the climate of the times like? And uh, we know that the final king, King Zedekiah, was a wicked king. And uh, we're told in Jeremiah that uh, God says, I will overturn, overturn, overturn it until he comes, i.e. Jesus comes. 
uh, to then rule. So we know what uh, that last King Zedekiah. Well, you can sort of look beforehand uh, of his uh, previous, uh, the previous generations. In fact, the last four kings, all very, very wicked individuals. And uh, if you're taking notes, second of Kings 23 reinforces that particular point, the latter part of that, verses 35 and 37. You would have picked up from uh, the reading in verses 1 to 4 of Habakkuk chapter 1 that this was a time of fear, it was a time of persecution, lawlessness and immorality. So again, that just gives us some sort of insight into the times in which Habakkuk penned these words. Now, there are some distinctive features that we find in the actual book of uh, Habakkuk. And the first of those is that Habakkuk, he conversed with God about people. It's sort of almost this inversion. Normally, the prophets received a message and went out and told the people. You'll be familiar with that, that God spoke a message. Yeah, the nation wasn't living up. Generally, it was Judah, but uh, there were some prophets to Israel. I.e., people, you're not doing the right thing. Messages come from God. Prophet has to go out and sort of say, look, I've got a message. Uh, We know that Jeremiah sort of, oh, he, he hated it. He knew he had to do it, but it was not going to be a message that was well received. What we actually find here with Habakkuk, this is a bit of a reversal in that the prophet himself actually goes to God and says, God, there are things that I don't understand. I just don't understand why you are not intervening. And indeed, uh, quite often with the prophets, the prophets were saying a message, God's going to bring judgment. That was really what the prophets actually did. They often had this message of doom and gloom if you don't repent. But Habakkuk takes things differently. Habakkuk is saying, God, I want you to come in and intervene. I want you to do something. Why is it, God, that you are overlooking all this wickedness that takes place? So in that respect, Habakkuk looks at things from a different perspective. But I think perhaps the most unique and indeed the aspect of Habakkuk's prophecies that most appeal to me are the fact that Habakkuk was prepared to ask the difficult questions. Yeah, Habakkuk deals with a number of questions that we, we all want to know in our lives. And indeed, in opening up Habakkuk chapter 1, really what Habakkuk is saying to God, what, why won't you respond? Why won't you respond? Now, I'm sure I'm not an orphan here. I'm sure many of us, with events that have taken place in our lives, have sort of felt... God, you're not responding. I'm praying, but you're not responding. Why is this the case? You see, Habakkuk took this and God provides an answer. In a sense, I think what Habakkuk also does is Habakkuk opens up the position whereby we can approach God with just so many questions. It's not just about us being reserved in our approach. Habakkuk looked at it and sort of said, I just don't understand. God, why aren't you responding? In a a sense, the the good news is God actually reveals to Habakkuk and says, this is the reason I am not responding at the present time. Habakkuk also asks God, are you really in control? That's one of the things that emerges when we start to look at Habakkuk. He wants to know, is God really in control? God wasn't responding. God was just allowing wickedness to take place in the nation of Judah and Habakkuk looked at it and sort of said, well, if there is a God and we're supposed to follow, why does God in a sense almost appear to be keeping uh, sort of a a distance and just sort of allowing things to go on? So again, that's a key question that Habakkuk asks. Why do the wicked prosper? You know, towards the end... Uh, of Habakkuk 1 and in particular when uh, we've got the fishing analogy. Uh, John, you'll relate to that immediately, Uh, the uh, the fishing analogy that's uh, there from verses uh, 14 uh, to uh, verse 17. Um, Immediately we've got a situation there that Habakkuk just sort of says, why is God just going to allow 
the Babylonians to just keep conquering nations and nations and nations and, and growing wealthy at the expense of others. Why, why did the wicked prosper? We won't see it tonight, but certainly in our next class, what will be revealed is, well, you know what? God's going to judge the Babylonians. You know, God has a plan and he's got a purpose. The book itself largely can be broken down into, I would say, three broad sections. Uh, there's questions and answers. So uh, we've looked tonight at the first set of questions that Habakkuk puts to God. Um, Habakkuk, of course, puts a first lot of questions. Then when God responds, he, he, he's bewildered. God, how could you allow an unrighteous nation such as Babylon to come up against a righteous people such as Judah? God, aren't you holy? You're a holy God, yet you're allowing this to take place. And, of course, God's response elicits further questions from Habakkuk because he says, I, I just can't quite see why this is the case. And of course, the, the Lord then provides uh, the answers. And finally, in Habakkuk chapter 3, all the pieces of the jigsaw come together and suddenly there is this epiphany for Habakkuk and he breaks forth into this uh, wonderful song which we'll consider next week where he extols and he says he's going to rejoice in the God of his salvation. And again, that's what we can take comfort in. We can take comfort in the God of our salvation. So what are the key messages that come out of this particular prophecy? Again, I think just keeping it uh, nice and simple to uh, three um, God wants us to come with our struggles and doubts. It's quite evident from what we read tonight, and this will also be revealed in our next class, that Habakkuk had doubts. He had doubts and he had struggles. He, he couldn't quite understand why God was acting the way he was. So it's, it's quite normal. Disciples can be faced with struggles and doubts in their walk. Habakkuk tells us, and Habakkuk provides us with, in a sense, the, the panacea for how we overcome those struggles and doubts. We have to realise that God is in control. Again, this is perhaps, I think, the, the biggest message that comes out of the prophecy of Habakkuk. Whatever circumstances are taking place, whatever we look around the panorama of life, we have to take stock, we have to realise God is in control. That's what Habakkuk is telling us. And again, we'll look at some supporting scriptures uh, to reinforce that as well. And finally, and this comes out in chapter 3 in particular, and it's a really, really nice way in which uh, Habakkuk rounds off. So it's around about Habakkuk 3, and I think it's verse 16. And that is that there may be unpleasant circumstances that we experience. Now, Habakkuk said that, you know, maybe the vine tree, there won't be any grapes on there. Maybe the farm, there will be no animals that are uh, on the farm. There will be destitution. There will be poverty. We'll be impoverished. But Habakkuk says, well, look, despite what might take place in our lives... What we can rely upon is God and we can take comfort in knowing the God of our salvation. And again, we'll explore that uh, next week in greater detail. I really like that, just the way Habakkuk brings things together and how he sort of, he looks the strident contrasts. You know, hey, it's not about the here and the now, it, it, it's all about the future. That's really what Habakkuk is telling us. Hey, very quickly, just a couple of key verses. Habakkuk 2 verse 4, hey, we're familiar with that one. Um, what about Habakkuk 2 verse 14? That's also one that's widely used within our community. The earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Don't we look forward to that time? That, that's a time when there is peace. That's a time when there is safety. That's a time when there is righteousness. That's a time when there is justice. 
That's Psalm 72, and doesn't the world need that at the present time? Peace and safety and righteousness and the return of Christ. Habakkuk speaks about that. The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. And that, of course, those words have been put to, to music and they, in our green hymn book. So again, there's just a, a wonderful uh, interlude, we might say, where Habakkuk just expresses, expresses the fact that the Lord is, is glorious, he's holy. And that's, of course, that's the aspiration for each and every one of us, that we want to be part of the Lord's holy temple. We also want God to remember mercy. In wrath, remember mercy. We want mercy to triumph over judgment. And again, we'll see that next week. That's what Habakkuk was looking for. In wrath, remember mercy. And we gather this morning to remember the, the mercies of our God. And that's something that we rely upon. We rely upon those mercies. And then finally, those majestic words... Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. There's just, as I say, just five very, very nice quotes that we can just sort of pick the eyes out from, from Habakkuk. And as I say, if you took nothing else away from what I'm saying tonight, you could sort of uh, just hang your hat on uh, any of those five verses. There's some inspiration uh, for the forthcoming week. All right, there's some key verses. Let's turn our attention then to Habakkuk chapter 1 and uh, what we read tonight. And certainly the issue of uh, Habakkuk, how long shall I cry for help? Well, for disciples right through the ages, this has always been a challenge. You know, we're not immune from the same challenges that disciples uh, right throughout have had to deal with and, and I've just put just a couple of examples there and there's sort of countless thousands uh, we could add but think about Isaac he, he wanted to have a child and that the promises to Abraham that they came through him and yet how long did he wait for a son it, it was 20 years 20 years was uh, the the duration and then of course uh, it was uh, two but God doesn't always work on the timelines that we would like. We live in a day and age where it's instantaneous. You, you, you Google the answer. You know, I, I have students these days and, and immediately they, they want to know the answer. Just tell me the answer. I want to know right now. And I want you to solve the problem right now. God doesn't necessarily work in the, the right here, right nows. What we do know is that God has a wonderful plan. But the timing is, is God's timing. The timing will be perfect, but it's God's timing. It, it's not our, our timing. Uh, the second example there is, of course, uh, Hannah. We know Hannah wanted to have a son. And uh, so there's that wonderful prayer in uh, the opening uh, chapter of uh, 1 Samuel. And, of course, Hannah did receive Samuel. But there was many, many years. It was not just a case of praying to God and uh, there was this immediate response. I really like Paul's writings, uh, 2 Corinthians 12. We're going to read that this week uh, in our readings. Uh, think about this, you know, what does Paul say in 2 Corinthians? He says, three times I prayed to the Lord. He had a thorn in the flesh. Um, don't know what it was, but um, hey, I, I think most of us, if you've had a thorn or a prickle, we know that it is very, very uncomfortable. Nobody wants it. Paul actually said, I have, I've got this thorn, I'd like it to be removed. What was the Lord's response? The Lord didn't say, look, I'm uh, not going to address your problem. The Lord actually said, my grace is sufficient for thee. My grace is sufficient. That, that's not some sort of second best, I'm not going to solve your problem. Look, I'll give you a bit of grace instead. That, that is the answer. That is the answer. Grace is always the answer. It doesn't mean that it's going to be the outcome that we want. But we have to take comfort that all things are working together for our good. And of course, rounding out what I've said there, Paul says, pray without ceasing. Just be continuous in prayer. 
You know, it, it doesn't matter if the responses are not immediate. And certainly, uh, as we read through uh, in Habakkuk chapter 1, it's quite clear that Habakkuk had been praying to the God of heaven regularly. You know, why aren't you answering my prayers? That's really what Habakkuk said. The issue of waiting patiently for God's response is also something that the psalmist takes up. And again, I'm not going to explore uh, all of those psalms. I really love the psalms and I think there is just a power of comfort that comes uh, from the psalms. And the psalmist on many, many occasions dealt with and grappled with this issue of having to wait patiently for God and in God's timing. Wait for the Lord, be strong and take heart. I waited patiently for the Lord. And again, there's many other psalms that uh, we could sort of add into that as well. I think the final psalm that I've got there, Psalm 73, starts to provide us with a real little uh, insight into our viewpoint and uh, what viewpoint we need to have with regards to waiting patiently. Because Psalm 73 is a psalm of Asaph. And Asaph was bemoaning the fact that everybody else outside of the congregation was, was doing well. The wicked were prospering. You know, everything that they touched turned to gold. They had that Midas touch. And Asaph was just, sort of, it, it was almost to a point where he said, my feet had almost slipped. I'd almost given up discipleship, we might sort of say, to put it into to common parlance. And it was when he got into the sanctuary when he sort of got to the meeting place with god light bulb moment ah he suddenly realized you know what the wicked have their day to day but those who are seeking the lord our salvation is to come there's a point of difference it is about making the choices today isn't it it's about seeking first God's kingdom and his righteousness. It's the choice between God and mammon. It's always been that particular choice. But it is about waiting patiently. So Habakkuk in verses 1 to 4 tells us that he's a little bit disillusioned that God has not acted as the, uh, the way that uh, Habakkuk thought that God should act. And then of of course, God responds. And God's response from uh, verse 5 to uh, verse 11 is, well, you know what? All of this wickedness that you've been telling me about, all of this injustice, this paralysis of the law, I'm going to solve the problem. Here's what I'm actually going to do. And he then goes on to say, I'm going to raise up the Chaldeans or the Babylonians, depending, of course, as to which Bible you've got. And what they're going to do is they're going to come down and they're going to judge the nation. That's God's response. And, of course, poor old Habakkuk sort of says, I just can't believe what I'm hearing. Why is it, God, that you're going to respond in that particular way. And, and so the words that uh, I spoke about earlier, where God says to Habakkuk, look at the nations, wonder and be amazed. Well, in a very, very short period of time, Egypt, which had been the number one superpower of the day, that was conquered. It was a broken reed, as Jeremiah uh, speaks about Egypt. Nineveh, the capital of the Assyrians, that was ransacked and taken over. And the Assyrian Empire, that's the one that had taken over Israel. That was no more. And of course, for Judah, for Judah, it meant that it was now going to be a vassal state. In other words, it was going to be subservient. A, a bit like we might say if uh, Russia is successful against Ukraine, Ukraine will be a, a vassal. That's... That's really the, the situation. And, and that's what God says is going to take place. Did you note the end of verse 5? It's God who's doing this. For I am doing a work in your days that you would not believe if told. 
So in other words, God says to Habakkuk, I'm working in such a way that if somebody said that this is the way God works or this is what's going to happen, they'd say, no, nah, I don't believe it. And God says, yep, this is what I am going to do. I'm going to act. But what does it also indicate to us? It also provides that reinforcement to us that God is in control. God controls the political scene. So whatever is taking place in the world around about us, it's not haphazard. Everything is under God's control. We won't turn to those quotes. You'll be familiar with Daniel 2. Daniel 2 is, of course, the image. And it makes it very, very clear that Daniel actually spoke to Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian, and said to him that, you know, God's the one who rules. He gives it to whomsoever he wills. Daniel 4, likewise, says similar words. And again, in Jeremiah 43 and Isaiah 44, we have further evidence. It's God who controls the political scene. Now, I look at and take those words, and to me, I derive enormous comfort. And whilst we might look at what's taking place in Ukraine, and certainly our heart goes out to those that are there, and in particular, we have brothers and sisters who are in Ukraine, our heart goes out to the devastation that is taking place. Nevertheless, what we can also and must also do, we must recognise that God is in control. Whatever takes place, God is in control of those circumstances. And of course, that perhaps begs the question, why then does God allow suffering? You know, th this is sort of one of those thorny questions. And I'm sure at different times in our lives, we've asked this, why, why, why would God allow such suffering to take place? We, we've got evidence right before us that suffering is taking place. We, we've had examples in the past where there's been natural disasters, huge loss of life, wars, COVID, all of these things. And we, we might sort of say, why does God allow suffering? And, and this is really the, the question that Habakkuk was trying to grapple with, particularly uh, in verse 12. Just have a look at verse 12 when he sort of speaks about, you know, you're from everlasting, uh, you're a holy one, we shall not die. You know, he's sort of putting forward the case, I just can't believe, God, that you're going to get the Babylonians to come down. There's going to be absolutely chaos and carnage. This is an issue, as I say, that we need to perhaps grapple with and Habakkuk provides us with an avenue to explore. Why then is there suffering? Well, we know it all comes back to the very beginning. In Genesis, God gave a law to Adam. He said, here's what you can do. You can eat of everything in this palatial paradise that I've provided for you. With the exception, there's one tree that you can't. One tree. And, of course, we know in the subsequent chapter what took place. And the curse that came as a result. And, of course, Paul in Romans 5 starts to speak about it, that, you know, death then passed upon all men because all have sinned. And likewise in Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians, Paul again speaks about that as in Adam, all die. And so a process of death and a process of devastation was the result. Cursed was the ground. That was what God said. But as we know, there was also hope. And Paul in Romans chapter 8 brings up that uh, issue of hope and he says, well, you know what? He says when he was writing, the whole creation is groaning in pain together. It doesn't matter where you look. There is pain, there is anguish. And he goes on to say, he said, do you know what we're waiting for? We're waiting for the sons of God, for the revelation of that new creation. 
that's what we're looking for. We're looking for Christ to come and immortality to be bestowed. Jesus, I think, perhaps provides us with the greatest insight into the issues of dealing with why do certain things take place. We might just quickly have a look at Luke 13, now, if we can, because I think this is a powerful section uh, of Scripture. Because there's a clear takeaway message that comes out that really gets... And it's the real cornerstone of both Habakkuk and what Jesus is saying here. I think you'll be familiar with the uh, the passages that uh, I've just uh, drawn our attention to. Uh, We've got a situation where it was obviously Passover time and Passover, well, it meant so much to the Jews and there was generally sort of some level of uprising that took place. And so in colourful language, that's what verse 1 is actually telling us, that uh, there was a few people who really wanted to do away with Rome and perhaps took matters into their own hands, were zealots. Well, their blood was mingled with that of the sacrifices. Jesus' answer, though, I think is really important for us to consider because Jesus says, do you think that those Galileans were worse sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered in this way. Do you think they were worse? Were they worse sinners? What's Jesus' response? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. You see, what Jesus is actually saying is that it's all about repentance. We're all going to die. We'll all perish if we do not repent repentance is everything repentance is the game changer repentance is our association in Christ repentance can prevent perishing well Jesus then gives another example he says look I want to give you an example it must have been well known a bit of shoddy workmanship you know multi-story building down came the tower and of course there was the loss of 18 lives And what's Jesus' response again? His response again, yeah, because he says, look, do you think that they were just worse individuals that uh, lost their lives? No, as he says in verse 5, there's a reinforcement, this reiteration of what he said in verse 3, unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. And that's, look, I know that can be sometimes challenging for us to, to face up to. But that's the reality and that's what Jesus is saying to us here. And the good news for those of us in Christ, for those of us in Christ, it it doesn't matter. We're all going to die. And I think this is a wonderful quote by Brother uh, Ron Hicks, which no doubt you've, uh, you've read there. It's not a matter of if, but when for all of us. Unless, of course, Christ returns very shortly. For some, death comes sooner rather than later. But it really does come down to our use of time. So it doesn't really matter whether we've got 20 years, 25 years. You know, in the kingdom, it won't really matter that Abraham lived for 175 years, I think it was, and uh, there were other disciples who quite clearly died in their 30s or 40s. That, that won't matter because it's eternal life. It's really just putting into a context our lives today. Okay, let's return then to Habakkuk because one of the issues that Habakkuk also grappled with was this issue of the righteousness of Judah. So look at verse 13. Uh, where he speaks to God. He says, you who are of purer eyes than to see evil and cannot look at wrong, why do you idly look at traitors and remain silent when the wicked swallows up the man more righteous than he? In in other words, what Habakkuk is saying is, you're going to allow the Babylonians to come down. These are unrighteous individuals And they're going to swallow up people who are more righteous. 
God, this just doesn't make sense. How is your holiness, how is your holiness able to look at something like that? Well, that begs the question. Was Judah more righteous than Babylon? Well, the answer is no, they weren't. You see, Judah had broken faith with God. And that, that's a little phrase, this breaking faith. We'll, we'll read it in Leviticus time and time again. If you're reading Leviticus, just look for this little phrase. They broke faith. In fact, we uh, read of it with the calf and with uh, Moses up in the mountain, that uh, the nation at that point, they broke faith with God. And, and of course, they weren't. When they broke faith, they were not more righteous How does righteousness come about? How does righteousness come about? Well, Paul tells us that righteousness comes through faith. And so hence, spoiler alert, that's where we're getting to in chapter 2. That's why God's response is, do you know what? The righteous or the just, they shall live by faith. So the reality was... Judah was not more righteous. This was God's judgments that were being brought against the nation. And then, of course, and I won't sort of drill down too much from verses 14 to 16, we've got this fishing analogy uh, that is presented to us. Uh, What we can say is that the Babylonians were noted for using fishing or fishing implements. Certainly they used to put hooks into the jaws of individuals, captives, and string them along. So the analogy that Habakkuk is actually presenting here is quite apt, in a sense, of how the Babylonians were. The Babylonians were barbaric. And certainly the uh, earlier verses in Habakkuk 1, you would have picked up just on a a couple of words that described how the Babylonians uh, actually acted. But I think the real question that emerges towards the end of Habakkuk chapter 1 is, of course, verse 17, where Habakkuk then says, is he then to keep on emptying his net and mercilessly killing nations forever? In in other words, is Babylon just going to keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger? Underpinning that question is really the question that we've got on the screen. Why do the wicked prosper? Why do the wicked prosper? That, that's, uh, that's a question. Uh, as I say, it's a key question that uh, does emerge right throughout uh, our studies uh, of Habakkuk. And Habakkuk is perplexed. Why could a righteous God, a holy God, allow this to take place? Well, Psalm 37 and Psalm 73, and perhaps we could add uh, the book of Job, You can almost throw the whole of Job, but in particular, Job 21. They make it very, very clear to us that the wicked might appear to prosper for a period of time, but that prosperity is always short-lived. And that's, as I say, when we continue on in our class next week, that's when we're going to start to explore the fact that even though the Babylonians would come down... No, God would not just allow them to keep going and going and going. They too would be judged like Judah. So what's God's advice for the righteous? Habakkuk, of course, and we're now in Habakkuk chapter 2 and at verse 1. Habakkuk's posed these questions to God. He sort of said, is this going to just take place where the Babylonians sweep down and they do whatever they want to do? Here's what I'm actually going to do. I'm just going to sort of take stock. I'm just going to have a breather. I'm just going to wait for God's response. And sometimes that needs to be for us as well, that we just take stock. We just give God a chance to have a response. And that's Habakkuk 2 and at verse 1. I'm going to look and see what is going to take place. We then read, of course, in verses 2 to 3, that Habakkuk is told first and foremost, that there's going to be a vision. You've got to make it plain uh, on tablets. 
I do like what the Message Bible actually says, and uh, I don't know whether uh, any of you uh, read the Message Bible, but the Message Bible actually puts a really interesting slant on it, uh, where it says, write what you see, write it out in big block letters so that it can be read on the run. In other words, a bit like a billboard. You know, we've all seen the advertising, the billboards that are around the place. You know, this is what God's advice for the righteous is. First and foremost, you've got to boldly share the message. What's the message that we've got? We've got a message of hope. We've got a message of salvation. That's, that's what we've got. And that's the message that we're going to see that Habakkuk rounds out in chapter 3. I'm going to rejoice in the God of my salvation. That's the wonderful message. So we have to be prepared to broadcast that far and wide. But the second piece of advice for the righteous is they need to live by faith. And that's, of course, the end of verse 4. And so that brings us to what we're going to speak about in our next class. What does it mean to live by faith? We read those words. It obviously had an application for Habakkuk. But what's the application for you and me? How does this apply in the 21st century? Well, we're going to consider that next week because, as we've already intimated, those particular words, the just or the righteous shall live by his faith, the New Testament writers on three separate occasions saw the importance of those words. So what's three things that we can take away from our discussions tonight? I think the first message that we need to take away is that God is in control even though we might look at events that are taking place be it in our own contemporary world or if we try to put ourselves in the feet of Habakkuk what we have to do is we have to remain confident that God is in control what does that mean that means that we need to wait patiently it's all on God's time you know often we want things to be instantaneous but everything is in God's time. Remember, he has appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness. Evil doesn't go unpunished. That certainly is one of the things. And that's going to emerge even stronger in our discussions. Habakkuk said to the nation uh, that uh, he was in in Judah, they're not doing this. And God said, well, you know what? I'm going to punish them. But he then posed the question to God and said, well, the way you're going to punish them with these judgments, that just doesn't seem right. So we're going to have to wait till next week to see what God's response uh, to Habakkuk is going to be. And the final point, unpalatable as it is. I know it's not palatable to say and to talk about suffering, but suffering is a consequence of sin. Yeah? Yeah? You eradicate sin and suffering goes. That's the cornerstone to the kingdom. The elimination of sin and the eradication of suffering. Thank you.